Okay, it looks like we we're recording, so I'm going to go ahead and start talking. Um, one thing to note is that I've put some placeholders for volunteers for next week, and um, I don't think I've had any volunteers, but I would like some. So uh, if any of you have recently done an analysis and you'd like to share, like a good one, um, I'm looking now, you can't tell it, but I'm looking at James because you've just done an analysis and it would follow on very nicely from what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I'm open for anyone who might want to do something. Um, so if you're thinking of doing something, please let me know. Another thing I want to say about the slots uh, and the schedule in the future is that we've tried different time slots, but we haven't changed the time slot for quite a long time. But uh, I would like to change the time slot, not possibly immediately. <laughs> um, there's a regular, another meeting that's a regular meeting. It's a monthly meeting that happens at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays, which I would like to attend. And I've, I've missed about the last six months of meetings because of this. And I, so I think I would like to shift. I like the 4 p.m. slot, but maybe I would like to shift it to another day, perhaps uh, Tuesdays would be the day. Um, Thursday is another possibility for the meeting. So I think if you have any thoughts on that, Tuesday to, for me is a neutral day, but for others that might not be the case. Um, Thursdays would be another neutral day for me. Um, but once per month, uh, some of you know about this and some of you don't, we are starting a uh, Coder Dojo uh, here at Harper, which will be um, at least uh, in spirit, if not physically, located in uh, Station Quarter with the idea of attracting some students, um, maybe some some young people, but uh, it, it could be very relevant for older people too, or people who want to learn Python. We'll be doing that on Thursdays uh, during that, that uh, approximately 4 to 5 p.m. slot once per month. And so Thursday might be a, a good day to move it to because it would overlap with the Coder Dojo. And the first meeting for the Coder Dojo will be in about a month. And I'll I'll keep mentioning that in here. Now for these, uh, I've caught up with keeping track of the last couple of meetings. I, it occurred to me that um, we had this puzzle day activity quite a long time ago now, weeks ago, before we took a little break for the summer. And I never um, released the solution to it. So if people want to go through the solution, maybe I would do that at a different meeting. Maybe that would be a good meeting for next time. Um, but for today, we're going to do um, random forest. And I've got two links here. One is uh, some slides. I'm just going to go through a brief set of slides. And the second link is a tutorial. Now, I've tried something a little bit different today. Often I'm talking and I'm showing code and doing live coding in our studio to everybody. But uh, today I've tried a new um, hot off the presses Quarto add-on. Quarto, remember, is that that markdown package for, um, for, uh, for R that uh, works well with live Python and works well with live R code for building reports and web pages and uh, presentations and everything else. And it's sort of superseded all other productivity tools where I use R code for me personally. Uh, and, and it's really popular with other people too. And they've come out with a new add-on that we're going to test drive today. So you'll have a chance to interact with some code and I will demonstrate this. So I've created a web page, an interactive web page with Quarto. And it's called Quarto Live. And uh, we'll try that out together. But first, I'm going to go through these slides. If you like to follow along, you can just um, download them and open them. I'm just testing that works just fine here. And the slides will be very short today. And we'll try to spend most of the time uh, in the tutorial. I'm just going to reverse my display settings. There we go. <clears throat> So we're talking about random forests. I know some of you have heard of and uh, know all about random forests, and this might be a new topic for some of you. So <laughs> like usual, I haven't made any assumptions about your background. This is a basic introduction. 
Random forests is a machine learning technique that is, um, it is mind blowing in what you can do with it, how powerful it is and, and how easy it is to use. Um, there are a lot of subtleties in it. It's been around for quite a long time now, um, which I'll, I'll show you some reading material when we get to the tutorial. It's been around for about uh, a little more than 20 years. Uh, sadly, uh, I vividly remember when the paper came out describing Random Forest, and I read it as a PhD student, and um, I remember discussing it, and it was very mind-blowing to us all. And uh, you could you could request from the author um, the source code, which was written in Fortran, to uh, to get it. And somebody in our department had gotten that, so we all ran it uh, ourselves, and we're we're using it. Uh, the year it came out. <clears throat> Since then, there has not been a revolution on it. It was such a brilliant idea that it it has become a a ubiquitously used and very popular method in uh, statistics. And I, one of the things I want to do today is just demonstrate an example with a couple of trivial examples, but one re real research example, which I'll show you in these slides. But uh, to describe to you why you would use random forest, when you would use it, and uh, ultimately how you use it in R. So that's what we're going to do. This is um, an official picture of, uh, uh, I believe it's a picture of that the author's um, uh, relative, a young relative, drew representing random forest. But first, the story about a data set. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a way that I use random forest quite a lot in my own work. Um, I use it to do uh, one particular thing quite frequently, although it, it is good for several different things, and I'll describe I'll describe those things to you um, in uh, in this meeting. But this data set that I want to tell you about has to do with um, uh, greenhouse gas estimation. It's a sort of a thing these days, especially in on farms, but also for businesses to uh, estimate how much um, greenhouse gases are liberated as part of their um, as part of our activities, our human activities and different endeavors. Um, we do it for different reasons, uh, for reasons of reducing those emissions for the environment, for reasons of um, reducing the cost of uh, our activities related to these. Um, this particular data set was about farms. It, uh, it's a project with, um, with Carl and some other colleagues uh, here at Harper <clears throat> with ABP Beef. Um, this involves uh, 350 farms that fall into the co-op for beef production for um, the Anglo Beef Producers Group. Now, um, this particular data set had a, a massive amount of predictor variables. It's 350 farms means that there are 350 rows of data. Um, and, but the predictor variables, uh, in this case, there were over 500, so more predictor variables than there are rows of data. This is a, a particularly extreme example of uh, what, what is referred to as the curse of dimensionality. Um, if you have a lot of predictor variables and you're trying to explain variance in um, your data set, the more predictor variables you have, the more uh, this is, uh, if you can imagine what this phrase means, in dimensional space, um, is this, uh, it's the different dimensions with, within which you can partition that variance. So if you have more variables than you have examples of uh, of your dependent variable, um, you've run out of dimensions. So that's the very most extreme example of uh, the curse of dimensionality. So it's impossible actually conventionally to, to analyze this data set um, without something like random forest. <laughs> the data quality for this data set are lowish is how I describe it. There is missingness in the data. Um, there is, uh, there are some values for some of the variables that, um, that are not quite right. Uh, for example, 
there are uh, variables where <clears throat> for the for the amount of greenhouse gases that are created, um, which might be um, all of them might be putative uh, dependent variables for this analysis. Uh, some of them have very large negative val values that aren't feasible. They, they wouldn't be feasible on a farm for, in the most extreme cases, for like 10 or 100 years. Uh, these are rare. I'm um, just giving you some examples of why the data quality are low. In, in other variables, um, where some farms would give exact values for things like the uh, average amount of feed fed to sucklers uh, on the farm, other farms, and there'll be large large groups of them, uh, would estimate these numbers. And so uh, agronomists have gone out and entered much of this data on behalf of farms. And whether they when they were missing data from the farmers or where an estimate was required, they've entered the same value over and over. So there might be some some variables where 50 farms have exactly the same value and and 50 other farms have exactly the same value as each other, but different from the other 50 farms. So uh, th those are not useful variables within those groups of 50 because they're invariant. And th there are lots of things um, like that. There are some mistakes in the data set too. And the last thing I'll say about that is that in a data set like this, some of the data are entered by the farmers or by the agronomists on behalf of the farmers, or um, some of them are are calculated and output by a, an algorithm implemented by the company who runs the carbon calculator. It's AgriCalc, by the way, a popular carbon calculator. So uh, we don't necessarily know the difference. We can guess sometimes between the difference, but um, there are examples of, of wrong and, and weird values for, for both of those kinds of uh, sources of data, both the ones calculated by AgriCalc and the ones input by farmers. Now, I mentioned the curse of dimensionality because it's related to one of the main reasons I use random forest. I use it when, when I've got a data set that has a lot of predictor or a lot of predictor variables. Um, and, I, and I know that I'm subject to the curse of dimensionality. What I will do is I will use random forest to reduce the dimensions objectively. I'll explain how that works, um, but first I just have defined the curse of dimensionality here. Um, this is when you have a data set and you're adding more features. And you, you can think of the features as sort of a, in the jargon of random forest, features are just variables, they're just columns in your data set. I've, I've kind of used the jargon term with the term variables throughout this and the tutorial, I kind of noticed that uh, after a first fashion, but they just mean the same thing. A feature just means a variable. Um, when you add more features, it's it's adding more of those n dimensions to your analysis. And it, it just makes it harder for any analysis, any, any algorithm, whether it's a linear model or whether it's a um, machine learning model to, uh, to pick out the patterns. And it, and it gets down to the ridiculous where if you have a large combination of features that uh, there might not be any variation in it. So for my data set here, it's 350 variables. Um, you can start to imagine if every, if every variable um, was a continuous variable, once we get up to, to uh, some number and the number that we would get to is below 350, because uh, remember, we we lose degrees of freedom in statistical models. To uh, we we would run out of degrees of freedom for any analysis. Now, that's one aspect of the curse of dimensionality. The other thing is that it's um, related to it is that uh, not only is it just difficult to to analyze, but it it undermines the strength of your predictions. Um, yeah, for the reason that we're running out of out of dimensions and degrees of freedom. So I mentioned that I use random forest in a particular way. I use it for dimension reduction. Um, the link to a paper that explains uh, how to use random forest for dimension reduction. 
on the tutorial, which I'll point out when we get there. But uh, one of the main things that Random Forest does is in the way of an output, and we'll, we'll look at this with several examples, is that it ranks the features that are used in your analysis based on their importance in explaining variation. Let me say that again. It's an objective way if you have a lot of variables to literally linearly rank and quantify how important they are in making predictions, accurate predictions. And so when you can do that, um, let's say your analysis, you want to analyze 10 variables, um, you can just pick the top 10. It's very simple. Or uh, as you'll see, when we look at the curve of importance, one thing that we look for is a shoulder where um, we might have some higher variables and then a big gap where the importance falls off. And if we have a point where there's a shoulder, it might suggest some number of variables that we can keep and, and which ones to exclude, where we can capture the greatest amount of data. This is important because um, it reduces the data set complexity, making your analysis easier. But the, the real big reason is that it um, makes it much easier to explain um, from a scientific standpoint or, or to people who aren't um, data scientists or statisticians. So I'm going to briefly go through a real analysis of that data set. Um, and I'm, when I say brief, I mean, I'm really briefly going to go through this. <clears throat> so I want to have time to play with the, um, the um, and I hope it works, the, the interactive tutorial. <clears throat> what we have here is a plot of the predictions arising from the random forest analysis I did. Now, this was looking at one of the measures of uh, CO2 liberation as a function of, uh, of everything else. Every, there were 328 features or 328 predictor variables here. The little dot notation, some of you will have seen it before, and it, and it literally means if you have a data object and you name a dependent variable, the dot just means everything else. So it's a, it's a way of uh, summarizing your formula notation. Now, this particular analysis explained 97% of the variation in our dependent variable. I was surprised that it explained this much, even though we had a lot of, a lot of features. This is really exceptional. It's such a complicated analysis that it is hard to explain. And uh, on this project, we have had difficulty explaining uh, any of the analyses we've done to the uh, to the other stakeholders, uh, there are various reasons for that. One is that the there is a lot of legitimate complexity and subtlety in the data set, but but another real problem is that the uh, the stakeholders have already in their mind the answer that they are psychologically prepared to receive, and the, and they're very stubborn about it. Someone else's problem. It's someone <laughs> else's problem, and um, the. I, I could tell you some funny stories of that, but in the sake of uh, professionality, I'll refrain from doing so at this time. But um, one of the things that really surprised me was that uh, because of the nature of the data set and uh, how I described the missingness and wrongness of some of the, the data, that it was so accurate. <clears throat> so this is a picture of, of that accuracy. And let me let me explain to you what this is a picture of. I mean, first of all, you see that there are a lot of dots and two variables, and that the two variables are very highly um, correlated. <clears throat> what you see over here is um, on the y-axis is based on the random forest model with all the variables um, is the prediction for a given farm for um, um, what its CO2 liberation is based on those 328 features. And what you see on the x-axis is the actual CO2 prediction for that farm. And, you know, we can quantify that. 
seven percent of the variation in the actual CO2 is explained by the model, and the predictions therefore are very very accurate. How do we come up with these predictions? Uh, I decided I made as a, a judgment at the beginning of trying to plan for what I would talk about today that I wouldn't spend very much time talking about the nuts and bolts of random forest, but uh, we'll digress a little bit here just to explain that the forest in random forest is a metaphor. And uh, a tree in the forest is an individual um, regression with some subset of variables um, of the columns that are chosen and some subset of rows that are chosen. So the model iterates at a number of times that you specify through your data set, randomly choosing different sets of variables and different sets of observations. And it does this many, many times. And at the end, for every model that contained a given variable, we average up the, um, the coefficient that is estimated from all of those trees in the forest. And we do that for every tree. And uh, essentially, that's that's how we uh, measure it. And as well, we create a training and a, a test partition of the data. And uh, what what the um, what this does is it iterates through all of the data with a train and a test partition based on the average weights of the whole forest, and it it comes up with this. Bottom line is this is a great model. The that's the good news. The bad news is it's, it's very complicated because it requires 328 variables to be so accurate. So how do we make sense of that? Um, well, we we make sense of that with something called a variable importance plot. I'm not going to um, spend much time looking at individual variables. I really just want to illustrate the concept with this. Um, even though, you know, like James and um, and Carl might be really looking at which variables are on this chart. But uh, in essence, this is the top 20 variables out of the 328. And uh, this kind of graph is a kind of graph that I have designed that takes into account two different kinds of, um, of, uh, of measures of importance. And... Uh, this is a, a random forest that has a continuous dependent variable. So it's a regression style um, random forest. And the regression random forest have mean square error, which is explained on average when the model contains a given variable. And so the length of the, this lollipop stick is the, the weighted um, amount of mean square error percentage explained by that variable alone. So um, the the actual scale of it, um, it, it this isn't the percentage on the x axis on the x axis, um, but the percent MSE. Uh, this is a weighted measure, a scaled uh, measure of the percentage of mean square error that's explained. So it's not literally the the output total kilograms explains around uh you know 12% variance um it, it's that it's the highest on an arbitrary scale that's a that's about 12 compared to the others so they're all ranked <clears throat> this goes down to um 328 rows i'm only going to show you the top 20 here notice already how there's a steep fall off of the uh of this variable uh, if we go to the top um, if I were to take the time to show you the 21 to 40 and 41 to 60, um, what you would see is that by the time we get to 60, um, there's no leftover variation that's explained for that or any subsequent variable. So we actually can we can explain 97% of variance in this data set with only the top ranking, I think it's about 57 or 58 variables. What it did then, this is the uh, what's meant what I meant when I said um, that I've done dimension reduction is uh, you know I know that I need fifty seven variables in a linear model to explain an equal 
uh, uh, equally accurate amount of um, predictions as this this random forest. And I know that because of the importance plot. But the curse of dimensionality re it prevents me from doing so. Uh, if I were to try to put 57 variables into a data set with only 350 rows, the computer would say, no, you can't do that because you don't have enough um, degrees of freedom, dummy. So uh, what most people would do, uh, the way that I love using random forest, is I would pick the top, in this case, the top 10. And um, I just uh, looked at the pattern of significance. Now, I'm using here conceptually and philosophically this linear model in a fundamentally different way than a scientific experiment, a uh, scientist conducting an experiment would use it. When you conduct an experiment, you have a pre-existing hypothesis about, um, about what variables are important or not. You do a linear model with exactly those variables in it, and then you get a yes or a no answer, and you learn something, whether it's yes or whether it's no. Here, I know all of these are the most important variables. If we look in the p-value column, the green values are p-values that are you know, statistically significant, and there are some that are not even close. But uh, I, this is not really the way that I'm using linear model here. Um, there's a paper, and I see Claire in the, uh, in the chat here, that is called the, uh, it's called something like the two cultures of uh, statistics. It's, it's like the two cultures paper. It's written by the same guy that invented random forest, same guy that that invented this method. And um, one of the cultures is the traditional scientific approach of inferential statistics. The other approach is we're really describing the effect sizes that we can derive from a whole set of features. So here, even though I've put on this p-value to satisfy people who love p-values, I'm not looking at the p-value. Here, what I'm looking at are these effect size estimates. And I'm looking at the um, error around the effect size estimates. That's what I care about for this analysis. Um, hopefully, I've convinced some of you that that's a valid approach. But uh, what we can learn with this is that um, we have a strong, you know, relatively large magnitude negative uh, estimate. It's the relationship of the total output to the greenhouse gas and a relatively small standard error. Whereas for this one, we have a relatively small estimate. It's negative, but it's very small, close to zero. And the, the standard error is relatively large and it, it overlaps zero if we multiply the standard error by, by, uh, by two, where we expect most of the values to, to fall in. So that, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the magnitude of these estimates. And another thing, before I go to the next slide, is that we, I've performed a transformation on the whole data set, which scaled all of the numeric variables so that they have exactly a mean of zero and exactly a standard deviation of one. And the reason I have done that, the reason I have scaled my variables, a, a scientist typically wouldn't do that unless under extreme circumstances, because it would make it harder to relate back to the actual scale of the, of the feature, which is of interest. But here, I'm just describing the variation. And by scaling that variable, I can directly compare the magnitude of the estimates, whereas I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't scale the variables. Now, I've packed a lot of information into this, and I've gone really fast because um, now I just want to go and open this tutorial. Watch me open it first, and I'll I'll say a few words, and then you guys are feel free to try along. And I would actually love to hear if it works or if it doesn't work for you. So I'm just clicking this, and notice there's something happening down here in the lower right. I don't know; it, it's already flashed off the screen, but it said it was downloading some stuff. I want to say a little bit about the technology um, first <clears throat> before I go down the tutorial. I've been very impressed with this technology because on a static GitHub page, 
what I think is happening is that this report is a live report. It um, it will read in data, uh, and it will use the internet to draw in our libraries, and it does so, I believe, um, our, I don't know how you guys think about such things or whether you think about them at all, but the, the, the statistical software R. Most of us use it with a different piece of software, an IDE called R Studio, but R itself is very small compared to um, other statistics packages. A recent installation of SPSS, another popular statistics package, uh, someone told me that it's over one gigabyte to install that on your computer. And uh, R is still around 100 megabytes or a bit less to install on co your computer and has far more functionality than SPSS. So it's very, very small by modern standards for software. Turns out it's it's small enough that it's also small by modern web page features. So if you've been to a web page um, and it downloads a video and there's a lag and you know some pop-up windows and all this stuff, this is the kind of stuff that oh, one it really angers me. I hate using web pages like that and I, I block them and use pop-up blockers and stuff like that when I can. But I hate that that part of the web, but it's become the norm to the extent that I believe this package uh, uses a modern web framework to just um, suck up all of the R code that it needs and it's running virtually in a virtual machine inside your browser. Uh, I wanna look into the technology more because I'm fascinated by it and I just can't believe it works on a static website just like, um, just like this GitHub Pages page, but it does. And I, I think there's a massive potential to do some interesting things with this for um, regular old scientists like us. OK, so uh, what I want to do in this tutorial is demonstrate Random Forest and the code needed to run it uh, to evaluate the outputs for the two kinds of Random Forest you can run. One kind is, um, is uh, with a categorical dependent variable, and one kind is with a dependent variable that is uh, continuous and then look at some of the visualizations i'm not going to show you the fancy visualization today but if there's interest in that i, I can walk through the code for that at a future time if you want to do some reading um, depending on how resilient you are emotionally and psychologically the uh, brayman paper is a classic it's highly cited uh, thousands and thousands of citations M maybe maybe 10,000 citations. Um, it's uh, you know 25 pages long and it's densely written. It's not written for mathematicians uh, and Brayman is well known for being a good writer, but it also is pretty heavy by modern standards. So that's the original academic paper describing Random Forest. One that I would, uh, would advise if you're really serious about learning and using Random Forest is the one by Genauer. Um, this is one that describes a method for variable selection, one that I've used in a lot of papers that I've written and published, <clears throat> and uh, also has examples in R. So it's it's quite a nice paper that's aimed at, at a practical audience that's going to use this stuff. And then um, one that I also think is great and shouldn't be overlooked is uh, that textbook that I've mentioned loads of times in here. I personally think this is the best practical machine learning textbook that's that's out there. It's been out for a few years in a second edition. Um, this is the R version, but uh, they um, they also have a Python version of it. I use it to teach the uh, statistical methods in machine learning class here at Harper. Um, and uh, the one that you should focus on if you're interested in random forest is the book on or the uh, section on trees and tree-like models. It's chapter eight, and they have lots of examples, and it's, it's quite a good one with, with exercise questions and lots of code. And if you're learning Python or something, they have a version of this book in Python as well. But the best thing about it is that if you just Google the book title and the author on on uh, James's website, um, they have a um, 
they have free PDF versions you can just download with all the code and everything too. Okay, so why do we use random forest? Just to reiterate myself, there's there's two principles that we use. We're either going to describe a large data set, which is the way that I use it often, for um, as as part of describing which variables are important for dimension reduction, or we're going to use it as a model of of itself to make predictions. We could we could use it to make predictions very, very accurately, as uh, I showed you in the talk with that example data set. Dependent variable can be either categoric or numeric. Um, another thing I haven't mentioned yet is that we're a free. I'm not going to go into all the technical reasons why, um, it, but we are free from parametric assumptions when we use random forest. It's a non-parametric method. The reasons for that are partly that it's descriptive and non-inferential, partly that um, it does randomization to come up with estimates um, that are used to weight the uh, different feature estimates for the random forest. Um, and, uh, and like I said, dimension reduction is my use case where I use it a, a lot. Okay, so um, we're just going to go through a simple classification where the dependent variable is a category. So I'm going to use the uh, famous iris data set. Um, I thought to mention the paper where the iris data set is coming from. It's one of the built-in data sets from, from, uh, from R. Um, R.A. Fisher used it to um, describe uh, principal component analysis in a in application to morphometric analysis for species identification. The data set is actually an older data set that was published by someone called Anderson. Uh, I thought when I put this citation in that I would just explain um, the annals of eugenics <laughs> here as well. I, I thought I would just say something about that because um, there, R.A. Fisher lived in a time when uh, the, the social concept of eugenics, the racist social concept of eugenics was a real thing. It was, uh, as far as I understand the history of it, which is not very far, it was uh, essentially popularized here in Britain. But also a lot of scientists were implicated because there was a scientific basis um, for, for what racists then went and popularized, uh, where scientists were interested in in animal populations and plant populations, the sources of genetic variation that led to the sources of phenotypic variation. And R.A. Fisher was one of those people that developed a lot of those tools. There are some scientists, let me name one of them, a famous one, uh, who's a, um, who's a um, relative of uh, Charles Darwin. Got his name has just popped out of my head, Galton, Francis Galton. So Galton invented the phrase regression, and uh, also was a statistician. He was a bit older than Fisher. Now, Galton was a eugenicist, and Galton was a well-known racist. Uh, he really believed in purging society from uh, weak genes and things like that. And, and he's, he's gone down in history as a, as a besmirched and tainted individual, and rightly so. R.A. Fisher has been drawn into that uh, partly because he was the uh, editor of the Annals of Eugenics. But there has been academic research that has exonerated R.A. Fisher of being a social racist, uh, even though he studied the science of eugenics. And uh, that's a long way of saying <laughs> that uh, I think it's important to recognize Fisher and not to just cancel him because he has been exonerated by historians of being socially racist, even though he was the editor of a journal called the Annals of Eugenics. Now, having said all of that, that's a very, very long explanation for why um, there used to be many, many examples around the web of the IRIS data set. And the IRIS data set itself has been canceled because of its connection to R.A. Fisher, and it was replaced by a penguin data set. <laughs> that uh, doesn't have any eugenics overtones. That's a very long way of saying that I'm still, um, I'm still supporting Fisher. Okay, 
So the IRIS data set, what is it? <clears throat> it's a data set with, um, with five columns. It's got five, three species of um, IRIS. Everybody who does this kind of work knows this data set very well. There are sepal and petal length and width um, measurements for each, for 50 individuals of each of the three species. So there's 150 rows in this data set. Now, if you want to plot this, uh, up here, I've uh, plotted sepal length as a function of sepal width, and I've, I've changed the color by species, and I've used the data for iris, and I've, I've made a little legend that's similar. Now, um, and note that you can edit and run this code. There's a little button there. You can start over. Uh, which will load up my code, but if we wanted to do some trivial things to this code, like um, change the shape of the dots, um, <clears throat> there and in the legend, and then run the code, three, two, one. We can do that sort of thing uh, with this. So you can play around with this. This is a trivial one to play around with, but maybe we could play around with the uh, random forest one later. And I'm I'm just so impressed at how it works. We can start over as well to get back to the original so you can't really mess it up. Um, now, we can very easily perform random forest by loading up the library random forest with a capital F. And uh, we call the random forest function. Um, and here, I'm going to call it on the uh, iris data set using species as a um, dependent variable, using that notation as a function of dot, which uses all the predictors. And then I'm just going to pr print the outcome of the um, of the random forest. <clears throat> now, this is a classification problem. And for a classification problem, we uh, get out what is called uh, a confusion matrix. That's this part down here. I'm just going to make that a little bit bigger for us to look at it together. Note that there are three, um, three columns, and there are three rows on the confusion matrix. And then there's a column it's called class error. And uh, what is happening here is um, <clears throat> we've got, remember I said we had 50 individuals of each species. So for Satosa, we are um, we're comparing the predictions to the actual values. Remember that graph that I showed you for mine for a continuous variable? This is a similar um, conceptually similar way of visualizing predictions for a variable with categories. Here, 50 out of 50 Satosa classifications were correct. Uh, so um, predicted versus actual. And for the VersaColor species, um, there were 47 that were uh, categorized to uh, predicted as VersaColor. Three were predicted as Virginica. So the class error, the proportion of class error here is 6%. And then for Virginica, there were four that were um, classified incorrectly as VersaColor and 46 correctly as Virginica. So 8% uh, error. Overall, we get an estimate. The OOB um, stands for uh, out of box. And it's because uh, it's a metaphor for um, putting the actual values in a box and making a prediction and, and pulling the prediction out of a box. Um, just a weird jargon term for, for randomization. So the out-of-box estimate of the error rate on average is 4.6%. A couple of other things. I, I Here it, it tells us a little about the random, um, the random forest model we used. And... Um, one of the ones that we sometimes want to think of is how many trees you want in your forest. How many trees do you want? Well, the more trees you have, the more stable your average percentages are going to be. 
but you, you don't want to run an unnecessarily large amount of trees because um, because one, it's computationally expensive and takes a long time, but two, it, it doesn't do any doesn't add anything to your model. And and actually, it, it can bias the model if you have some variables that are represented more than others. Um, you don't want to pick too few because then your your model will be all over the place and it won't be consistent. So the, the number of trees you pick is, um, there are some algorithms, I'm not going to go into what they are today, but uh, there are ways of picking the variables. And usually by trial and error, when, when you're developing in a model, you'll run a small number of trees, like 500 or 1,000, they'll run fast. And if you have a big data set, much bigger than this one, um, you'll, you'll up the amount of trees until your model is more or less stable, <clears throat> but not go beyond that. Number of variables tried at each split is how the random columns are chosen. Um, the one algorithm, I've never messed around much with uh, the number tried at each split. The, the default algorithm is um, the square root of the number of columns or features that you have um, rounded down. And uh, so the square root of, we have four features in this data set. So we would always use two at each split. I just want to demonstrate something. If I make this a bit smaller, is if I add into the random forest call in tree equals, let's say, 25. So the default is 500. I've just turned that to um, 25. Let's run the code. So uh, keep an eye on this column and look at how, what that does to the class error. I'm just going to click it run a few times. Three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. I mean, this data set is is pretty um, pretty stable. I'm just going to change it back to 500 real quick. If we uh, put it up to 500 and we click it a few times, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. It's not changing very much. And it's just, uh, um, it has to do with the stability of the averages that you're getting due to randomization. So if we go down here, the way to look at the importance plot, this isn't fancy looking, this is just the default plot. We use the var imp plot with a capital I and a capital P function. We run the code. <clears throat> what we see here is that um, here I, I did sepal length and sepal width. And a thing I didn't remark as we were passing is that for Satoza, he circles down here, there's really good separation from these other these other ones. But for Versicolor and Virginica, for the sepal length and sepal width, man, there's a lot of overlap. You know, they we're not going to easily be able to tell tell these species apart based on these two variables. So if we look down here at the importance plot for our model, what we see is that actually petal width and petal length are by far the highest predictors. And uh, you may have noticed when I clicked run the code that these, these importance estimates shifted just slightly. So if I run the random forest again, and I run the variance importance plot again, just watch these dots, three, two, one. They just shifted a little bit. This is with 500 trees, but the order didn't change. Um, the petals are by far more important than the sepals that I graphed above. This suggests that the petal width and length would be a lot better at separating the species than would the sepal length and width. And if if we if we go down and make the plot like that, so this is just the same code as above. We can see indeed that the separation on these two variables is much better than uh, than the other one. Um, any comments or questions so far? Is, is anyone trying to run the code at the same time? And are you able to tittle with the code and run it in your own browser? Is anybody having a problem with that? Maybe a, a works for me in the chat if you've if you've tried it. Just works for me. Works for you. Okay, that's good. 
I'm so excited about this because it seems to be working and is resilient and it's exceedingly easy to implement. So um, I was hoping that people would say it's working good. Thank you. All right, so here's a regression example. <clears throat> One of the other um, non-eugenics related data sets that is uh, a tried and true one in the uh, R world and in the statistics world is um, referred to as MT cars. This is one of the built-in data sets in R. There, some of you may, I'm sure most of you know, some of you may not know that there, there are about a 150 or so data sets built into R, all of which are classic data sets. There's actually quite a lot of classic agriculture data sets built in as well. The MT cars is one of them that um, this is kind of a funny data set. It, um, it's basically made up of old cars that were sold in the United States. And uh, believe it or not, you can see a Mazda RX-4. I don't know if any of you like cars, but uh, this is the newer version of this car data set. And it's still quite old, as you'll be able to see from the cars that are in the data set if you, if you explore it. Um, it would be fun maybe to ask people if they had any idea what a Datsun 710, Datsun hasn't existed in a while. Does anybody know what uh, Datsun has transmogrified into? Anybody know? It's a Japanese car. Yeah, I actually owned a Datsun uh, a long time ago. It, it's turned into Nissan uh, or a Hornet or a Valiant. Anyway, these are all old cars. They tend to be very big cars. They tend to have very big engines and terrible gas mileage. What the data set is about is, is looking at variables that, um, <laughs> that relate to... Um, miles per gallon. This is typical, Carl. Whenever you have an online class, it's it's like uh, it's like you're preaching to um, cemetery stones. <clears throat> um, miles per gallon, the number of cylinders in the engine, um, the displacement. I think this is probably in cubic centimeters. Um, the hit, uh, I almost said hit points, the horsepower, um, the what is true? This is something to do with the differential ratio of the rear axle. I can't remember what that one is. We can look it up in a second and we can test how resilient this code is. The weight um, and, and so forth. It goes on. How many carburetors there are in the days the carburetors existed. <clears throat> okay, so um, what I wanted to do with this one was I wanted to make some, just to demonstrate, wanted to make some plots of the raw variables. We have talked in here a few times about plotting, if you're, if you're gonna model in a linear model, some sort of, um, let me just make this bigger again so that people can see a little bit better. Um, if we're gonna model in a linear model, I've talked about the, the importance of plotting the raw data, but also, plotting the uh, marginal values of, uh, <laughs> yeah, Dotson is way, be way before your time. <clears throat> um, plotting the, the marginal values of, um, uh, from the linear model of individual variables, the marginal values taking into account the variation that's explained by all the other variables too. So I just want to go through a simple example here to look at why this is important to think about. Is um, one, I'm going to create a series of plots that's just the normal plots of the um, of the raw data. And second, I'm going to use one of my favorite packages, VisReg package, plotting marginal effects for a linear model for individual variables. It, I know some of you. I, I know I've talked in here about VisReg and I've worked with some of you with it, but I can't recommend it highly enough to really understand your models and your data. So I'm just going to run this code. And then we can look down here. And um, a thing that's that's uh, real obvious from the raw data is that in each case, the y-axis variable is the miles per gallon. Now note the scale here. The, there's some that are only getting 10 miles per gallon. These are probably like a Cadillac. So 
It's a good car to drive after a war. If anybody gets that reference, please let me know in the chat. Uh, but you have to be really old. There's only one or two people that even have a chance. Um, 30 miles per gallon is considered very low by these days. And, uh, you know, the highest inefficiency vehicles in here only come up to 30. But look at this. There's a strong negative relationship between miles per gallon and displacement, miles per gallon and horsepower, miles per gallon and weight. The heavier cars um, have the worst miles per gallon, the worst mileage. The, uh, the highest horsepower cars have the worst mileage. And the highest displacement, the engine size, have the worst mileage. That's not surprising. But let's look at the marginal effects. I actually see quite a different picture here for one of the variables where there are other variables, obviously, that influence the straightforward effect of displacement. And uh, this is a complication for interpretation. And what random forest should do is it still should pick out this strong negative relationship for displacement. But for interpretation, we would really have to dig a little deeper in this for multivariate models to understand what's going on. And this is probably caused by um, displacement being strongly correlated to some of these other variables, like uh, the size of your engine is probably very strongly positively correlated to the, the horsepower of your engine. And let's just test the old um, let's test the old code here. We can um, copy plot horsepower as a function of displacement. Data MT cars. Run it. And, you know, it is very strongly positively correlated. So um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is run random forest on this. And this time I'm going to set a seed. Haven't mentioned this before. Because there's randomization in terms of selecting which um, columns and which rows to, to do. If you use the set.seed function, you can um, you can uh, set the kernel of that randomization. I don't I don't know if some of you know about this. We've talked about it in here before, but it, it turns out that if you if you have a number, making a string of random numbers after a given number, we've we've cracked that that um, algorithm. We know how to do that, and we've known how to do it for pretty well for quite a long time. But choosing that first number is uh, is actually making it random is a very, very hard problem that hasn't been solved in computer science. Um, and so we have algorithms to set a seed for that first number and then to create a pseudo random, very similar to random sequence after that number and like uh, in modern computer systems, one method of setting the seed, it's different on different computing systems, uh, is to uh, choose the number of seconds that have elapsed since January 1st, 1970 in Linux. That's how it happens. Uh, in Windows, I have no idea. Or you can manually set the seed and uh, run a random forest. So if we want to get, if we want to be able to replicate our results every time, get exactly the same answer, we have to set a seed. If I run this, um, here I've set the trees to a thousand. MT cars, MPG is a function of everything. Um, some other things I'm not going to mention, and we look at the fit. Now the fit looks different for a regression model. Here, instead of getting a confusion matrix, we get the percent of variance explained. I've just heard the tolling of the bell, which means we're out of time, which is um, fortuitous because we're right at the end. And if we just look at the fit, we also get different kind of fit for a regression model. Here, we get two measures. I've already showed you these in my talk. Um, I didn't explain the Gini measurement for a categorical variable, but um, I plotted both of these in the that lollipop plot in my talk. What we're looking for here is we're looking for a shoulder where there's a cutoff of important variables. And maybe between these two measures, I mean, most people 
a lot of people might just stick with they might just ignore no node purity. Uh, I explained mean square error to you. Node purity is um, how much the accuracy of the model decreases if you leave a particular variable out. So if you have these two, one of the things that I always glance at is whether the top few are exactly the same. In this one, the top four are exactly the same, but then we get a little bit of switching for them, but it's not much in it because they're similar. So these are the kinds of diagnostics you look. Um, I think the last thing that I really have to say is here, and uh, I've got a, a list of the whole function with all the defaults and arguments. So there's, there's quite a lot of subtlety that I've skimmed over. And if you want to really control your random forest, you would probably typically, I would typically alter some of these arguments to tune the model, I know, like I did, in, but I didn't explain it fully in the talk that I showed you. And uh, some considerations for you going forward is uh, you need to think about how many trees you use. That's one you have to control for almost every analysis. You need to determine how you're going to handle the set seed. Oftentimes, I will set a seed on a something I want to publish um, if I'm sure that my random force is stable. And another trick that I sometimes use is I'll try to get a stable random force, and then I'll run three with different seeds, and I will average the results manually. Um, another thing you need to consider is should you scale your variables? Remember, we're explaining variance. So if you've got some variables that um, you know, a set that have very large scales and large variances. Can you transform them? You can transform them so manually. You can use log transformations. You can use log transformations. You can do that. Um, scaling them where they all have the same mean and standard deviations, another way to do that. So, yeah, you have to do that. Um, so, for your data, should you do that? And what is the approach you take? Um, another one I haven't gone into. But uh, a very common method in this, if you're really, um, really digging in, is uh, to create new features, new variables from your existing variables. One that I do all the time, haven't done it on the beef data set yet, but we even did talk about it a little bit today in our talk. But um, if I have a very skewed variable, let's say, and uh, maybe a lot of zeros in a, in a data set, Maybe instead of having a numeric variable that scales from zero to 100,000, we could log transform it or do something else. But another trick that I use very frequently is I'll just say, right, I have one category of variables that's zero and one category that's above zero. So uh, when I do that, if I were to do that, it would be called um, feature creation. And you can do that for all of your variables. Um, I have another analysis I'm working on at the moment looking at environmental and landscape features that influence moth biodiversity for a 50-year-long data set. And we've done that with all of the variables because bi geographical variables are so so difficult to, um, to deal with. How do you deal with missingness? I, I did not, I mentioned that that was a problem in my beef data set, but I didn't mention that random forest doesn't deal with missing variables. You can't analyze a data set that has missing any missing variables in it. Um, so you can you can instruct it. Its default is to fail if there's any missing variables. You can instruct it to ignore missing variables, in which case it'll drop those rows that have missing variables for each tree. That can produce bias if you have some variables that are missing more than others. And yet another one is to permute uh, the missing variables to, to values that are reasonable compared to other, other variables that you have. So you have to almost always with real data sets, you have to deal with that. And uh, I've got should you scale twice. I guess I thought that was really important, which I do. <laughs> and that's the end. Um, any comments or questions before we end? I'm just going to turn off the video.